Hello, you're very welcome along to this week's edition of the group chat. I am news correspondent here at Virgin Media News, Richard Chambers. I'm joined in studio by political correspondent Gavin Riley. It's like you took a deep breath there as if you were trying to think of a better, like, comical way to introduce me there. No. Okay, no. There's, there's no there's no fun in politics. How are you, Richard? Good. Are you keeping well? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks, yourself? Uh, yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Zara King is not with us as of yet. She will be with us a little bit later on in the program because she is live and on location. So we have the best possible substitute in for part one of the group chat. <laughs> and that is Michael Fry. Hello, everybody. Help me buy a home here yeah. on Virgin Media Television. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. The Chad Michael Fry versus the Virgin Media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael, um, you have been working. You've been very busy. I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, Tell yeah, us yeah. a little bit yeah. about Help Me Buy a Home because mm. it has been something that is, it's a six part show, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So you're getting in deep. You're getting deep into the weeds of the housing situation. Aren't yes, you? I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's good. It's interesting. It's kind of where Liz helps people in a practical step by step kind of thing. I look at the issues surrounding the housing crisis. So people trying to get deposits together. I talked to Rory Hearn about solutions. I spoke to the Minister for Housing in week one. We talked to the Finnish Minister for Housing. I talked to people who've, you know, decided to not rent anymore. And there's a guy living in a boat, a woman living in her van. And then we talk about things like community led housing. Um, and uh, I think I, I get visited by a mortgage advisor at one point as well. So, um, yeah, a lot of different things, which is fun. I like there, how you sort of said mortgage advisor like it was one of your seance sketches that you got visited by yeah, somebody. Yeah, I visited <laughs> by three, three mortgage really advisors. Exist, somebody yeah. just came to you in a vision one night. Three ghosts <laughs> appeared. Yeah, yeah, I visited him, actually. Yeah. <laughs> as a minister. Yeah. Um, before the show was released, mm -hmm. there was a little bit of backlash online. Uh, it was actually as the show was released. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, we um, the clip of me, the start of me meeting the housing minister was released online and people took that to mean I was making the minister look good because it was the first clip they'd seen and then decided not to watch any of the clip or any of the show and decided that I basically had caused the housing crisis. So that was fun. Um, but I mean, people get emotional and that's fine. You know what I mean? I, mm. I understand that. I understand the kind of the, the trigger reaction to be like, because people are very frustrated or whatever, that's fine. I got a lot of criticism. I only got some abuse, right? You know, which is, you know, look, it's it's not. That's kind of part of the job, unfortunately. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Um, but I think it kind of ended pretty quickly when people realised I was talking to Rory Hearn the 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 week after that, and it was a six part thing. And my five minute interview with the housing minister wasn't going to cause anything to happen really so yeah. um yeah unusual i'm not used to it do you think you it know? was a prejudging and, and did you think that there's anything which was quite legitimate in what people were saying in terms of the criticism rather than any of the abuse yeah. it'd be obviously the abuse is beyond the pale but mm. in terms of any critiques or people i think it showed a lot of the emotion that is wrapped up in this situation which so many people of of the generation are facing yeah yeah look it, it looks cozy i understand that i understand that uh, it looks like I don't challenge him. I do in the piece, but probably not as much as I could have done or should have done. And not everything I did or asked was included. So it's kind of like, it is only a snapshot of a six hour day. You know, it's a five minute clip. Most radio segments are 10 minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we weren't, we weren't going to get into the weeds of it. Um, but I think it's just another way to engage with the minister, as in it's outside of news programming. It's people who might necessarily know his name or his face. And that is the case, mm. unfortunately, that people aren't engaged anymore. Or they don't, you know, whatever. They're, they're not paying attention because things are so bad and have been for so long. So I guess it's another way of asking him questions. And mm. he's a guy who makes decisions. So why not ask him questions mm. at every given opportunity, you know? So, so for people who didn't get to see the episode, which mm -hmm. was the week before last uh, on Virgin Media 1 on Sunday nights, um, you followed him around for two thirds of his day. So yeah. you, were, you were in the back of the car with him yeah. asking him questions before he went out to go and visit a site. Mm -hmm. Did you at any point feel like it was being deliberately sculpted so that he was trying to put his best foot forward and look like it was a sales pitch rather than it being an honest kind of engagement? Well, I mean, that's what he's going to do. That's mm. He's a politician. He answers questions. That's his job. And he's been asked every possible question. So he's a dab hand at this. He knows what he's doing. Um, I, d I don't know. I, th I think there's obviously reasons he said yes to it. Mm. Um, but, you know, I did my best to make sure I challenged him, you know? Do you believe what you were told? No. Uh, to be honest, <laughs> I, I, think, I think, look, I think he believes uh, that he is doing the right thing uh, and he, that he is, you know, helping things or whatever. I don't think it's enough. I think it's very impressive to point mm. at a huge housing estate that you've built that's a thousand houses. But when you think about the actual need we need 30 mm. times that, I think, at minimum, by the government's estimate. So it's kind of like, right, you can show me, if I'd interviewed Owen Murphy, he would have done the same thing. Yeah, exactly. We're building these things. Here's a hard hat. Let's go out here. I'll show you this scheme that we're doing or whatever. 
it's just at this point, and I do say this to him at the very start of the piece, it's like we've been told for 10 years, it's been a thing my whole adult life and probably even before that, mm. that things are returning a corner. I can't wave a magic wand. You know, I can't fix things overnight. But, mm. you know, there's been a lot of overnight. So mm. what are you actually doing? So it's kind of, I don't think we, we come to a conclusion in it. I think I'm very much like people can scrutinise what he said to me. But I really have to reserve judgment until something actually happens yeah. because I've seen all this before. That, that is know? a good point, actually, just to mm. make in terms of, you know, the presentation of these things, because that is something that the government and the Department of Housing will do, mm -hmm. that they will bring journalists out and say the Minister for Housing will speak at the launch of this new development of yeah. 10 houses yes. uh, yeah. somewhere. And it's like all of the figures that you're actually providing in terms of what's being delivered mm -hmm. are falling far short of your own projections and your own targets. So yeah. it just seems like such a, it, it does seem like window dressing on a, on a huge problem. Mm. Did you learn anything surprising in the process of making the show? Anything that mm. surprised or shocked you about the way things are? Yeah, I think we interviewed Finland. So I interviewed the Finnish Minister of Housing later on. Who you said you interviewed Finland? Oh, we interviewed yes. Finland, yeah. I was like, <laughs> they were all there. Hey, <laughs> oh, hi, Michael. Yeah, that's the whole. Um, yeah, when we talked to them, I was, we had a look at kind of homelessness and Finland operates this thing called the Housing First model where you give someone a house and then they sort themselves yeah. out. Whereas in other countries, say like us or the US or wherever else that doesn't have a housing first model, a house is seen as kind of like your prize at the end. You know, you have to sort yourself out and your secure accommodation is the last thing you get for being a good person and for not being addicted to things and all that kind of stuff. Whereas in Finland, it's very much like, right, you have your problems. Here's a house so you can actually have a stable home and sort yourself out. And that's kind of, that was interesting and it's it's mad that we maybe haven't got that or whatever, mm -hmm. but I mean, we have such a lack of supply at the moment that we don't have houses to give to people. Does Finland know? just have loads of spare accommodation that it can give to people that it's got the luxury of being able to pursue a policy like that? Yeah, I mean, well, they had a housing problem in the 80s. So they sorted it out then. There was massive buy-in from the charity sector, from uh, the private sector, from the state, all that kind of stuff. Everyone got together and decided, right, we need to sort this out. And they built the houses. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, we just aren't building enough, you know? Mm. I don't think there's enough of an ambitious buy-in from, from everybody and there isn't something that everybody has bought into yet that we're going to sort out, you know? I do know, yeah, I do know that Peter McVeary Trust and Dublin City Council have been working on a sort of, a, basically a pilot scheme for Housing First. So mm. it works on a very, very small level here. But as a solution, as you say, it, it does seem to be a much more radical approach than the one which is being taken here. Mm. We do actually talk to Sophia House in Dublin as well, who mm. do the same thing. That's their their thing. But they're, the difference is that they have the wraparound supports. Yeah. So it's an in-house kind of, they give people the, the house to live their lives and all that kind of stuff. They don't enter their home. It's not a, a hospital. They're not, you know, it's their home once yeah. they get in there. It's a transformational yeah. change that it does create for people like who are, you know, given that, you know, just given that security, that security is a huge thing in mm. terms of addressing some of those other concerns, whether it be, you know, uncertainty or addiction or mental health issues. That is such a cementing thing and fundamental base to give people mm. to allow them to address those things going forward rather than, as you say, sort of just putting this at the end of a string and just moving it further and further away from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you live in temporary accommodation like hotels or wherever it is, you're shunted from pillar to post, it is really hard to sort yourself out when you have addiction issues. So it's kind of, it's common sense, but it's kind of, it seems really far away in yeah. terms of where we are, you know. Having filmed the whole thing now, as it's gone out for the next four Sunday nights again on yeah. Virgin Media One, having done all the thing and sp spoken to Rory Hearn and spoken to the Finnish and Irish Ministers for Housing and all these other people as well, do you come away with any more optimism that there is, at least in in someone's mind, some kind of master plan to get us out of the, the, the morass that we're in? Or do you come away almost more disconsolate thing where we can get started? Oh, I think that second one, I think. Okay. I think I did, I... I fluctuated during the program where I'm like, great, there's something happening. And then you realize it's not enough. You realize the scale of the problem. So it's that thing where, okay, he's showing me things that he's done, but it's a drop in the ocean. Mm. There is like, I didn't think that ever think there was nothing being done. There is something being done. Mm but it's not enough yeah. and it's we're not catching up to where we should be, I think. Yeah. But that's like, you know? that, that has to be our experience as journalists as well. I mean, I, like Michael, you're saying that, you know, this has been going on for years and years and years. There's been mm -hmm. a load of, we won't get this fixed overnight, but there's loads of overnights. Yeah. Like it, that is the feeling that I come away with when I deal with housing issues as well. And we've yeah. been accused of it sometimes on the, on, on the group chat as well of being like, you know, you're too negative about this, that and the other. Yeah. But like when you come across the scale of the personal problems that this leaves people and the, the level of, 
you know, hopelessness that is there amongst people yeah. in the, their 20s, 30s and even into their 40s about the housing situation. Well, how can you come away and think that anything is actually going to be done about it when we have been effectively having the same circular conversation about mm -hmm. housing yeah. for years and years and years before pandemic? You can't blame mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, all this sort of stuff. So I do feel that is an, a very natural response to have when you're working on a show like that is just to be like, well, this is actually this is actually worse than I thought. Yeah, I mean, we only deal with a small part of this. We deal with people who are able to buy a house, yeah. you know, and we do touch on not being able to get a deposit together, but we don't touch on the really serious stuff like homelessness or whatever. This is a really small snapshot of the problem. But even then, when you talk about younger people and how loads of us, it's it's rare that people would live outside of the home yeah. and mm -hmm. people are living at home until they get engaged nearly. Mm. Um, or they're, you know, they're having to move back. We have a... Um, a participant Emma later on, or in the first episode of the show who was outbid by an institutional investor and had to move all her stuff back to her parents house and that's the assumption that like, you have a good relationship with your parents and that you're able yeah. to move home and they yeah. have room for you and all that kind of stuff and I just think the scale of the problem I don't think if like if we counted our homelessness the same way as Finland does uh, like they include people living at home with their parents as homeless or like not where they mm. want to be if we yeah. did that like the figures would be like 300,000 or something yeah. like that so, like talking you know. to the Simon communities last week after mm. the last homelessness figures were at 11,988 and they were actually positing the idea that maybe our official figure of homelessness has kind of flatlined because we've actually just run out of emergency accommodation that yeah. there are about 12,000 beds in the country yeah. and they're all full so we actually literally have we don't have the means to count any more people who become homeless as and when they do. Mm. Um, just by the by, I think it's probably very easy in our line of work, Richard, to get very cynical about what, what scale of progress there is on housing mm -hmm. because you and I have both been to plenty of photo ops with your Dara O'Briens or with your Owen Murphys and they're going to the turning of the sod of a relatively small number of homes which will make a huge difference to the lives of the people who end up living there mm -hmm. but it's such a small amount mm -hmm. and not alone do they end up then celebrating such incremental progress as a big deal but also it means you end up getting loads of B-roll of like you go looking for B-roll of Owen Murphy Good it's B-roll of Owen Murphy walking around with a hard hat with a, like a, a high-vis vest and it looks like he's always on sites going about getting stuff done when in That's fact actually a really good we, point. we know that yeah. there isn't as much really being done at all because like if you set and you bring the media out uh, here's a lot of new houses mm. Anytime you're mentioned in the news from there on out, yeah. it's you with loads of yeah. lovely the, shiny the housing, the housing minister, yeah. Owen Murphy, is under pressure this week after it emerged that blank, blank, blank. Here's mm -hmm. some footage of Owen Murphy who's walking around a, a building site. So it looks like he's always getting stuff done when the metrics yeah. don't don't always prove that. That is, has been works. Michael, I wanted to ask you more broadly on politics because like mm. so many people in, in, in your generation slash our generation, I don't know what the age gap is exactly, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to age myself too much. But like, <laughs> Generally You're speaking, closer to his age than I am. That's that good. At least, okay. at least that gap. But um, people are, do you think people are fed up with politics? Because there is often that view which you hear expressed from the commentariat and from like people in politics that young people don't care about politics mm -hmm. or if there is just a general, you know, I mean, Gavi's words, cynicism there as well. I mean, yeah. what is your feeling on the state of politics and how it appeals to young people in this country or fails young people in this country probably, I'd imagine. Is what yeah, I, I think, I think we're, we're, ready for change, I think. I think something's going to happen the next election, whether it's Sinn Féin get in or whatever else, uh, because I think we've seen success of governments ignore us mm. in lots of ways. Like the whole way through my 20s, I definitely felt like the feeling was off home. Do you know what I mean? That's how I felt the whole time. Or, you know, just go away. Mm. Go away until you earn some money and then come back and then we'll treat you with some respect. Do you know that kind of thing? Yeah. That's, I think that's, young people are really, really frustrated or whatever. And I think a lot of the, 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 leap to Sinn Féin or other parties is because, you know, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael do not care. Do you know what I mean? And they haven't, they haven't really shown that they care or that they're going to engage with us or anything like that. I mean, you, I was it Bertie Hearn last week to Keir Phelan being like, oh, you're yeah. a young person. Do you even yeah. know when the, when the election is? It's just that disdain and contempt for anyone younger than you. Do you know, I think we've, we've a real disgust towards people under 35 in this country, you know? I think if there was a war, we would send them all off. That was a, that'd be a thing that plenty of sections of the competition would do that to us. So it's kind of, you know. Uh, total gear change before we let you go. Yeah. How do you feel about being the unwitting face of the return of like drinks, carriages on trains? Because it, yeah. it, it is now impossible <laughs> to illustrate any story about the return of onboard catering without pictures of you and your display Kit Kats. Yeah, from season three of it feels good. It's nice to have like a kind of a thing people will remember me for. If if <laughs> if nothing else, I was the Kit Kat guy from from Dairy Girls. It always is funny to see like you know just my face every so often yeah. in the costume um, beside the Kit Kats or whatever. You got I to keep the costume as well. Yeah, well, no, I didn't. No, I didn't even get a Kit Kat out of it. So I mean, you know, 
Even though they're displaying Kit Kat. Even though, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm ready. If they want to do a sponsorship, I'm totally ready. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. Come on. Like, <laughs> well, the chocolate brands are available. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they may not be as good. But anyway. Uh... Like, if I help me buy home, is the show Sundays at 8 o'clock? Sundays at 8 o'clock, yeah. yeah. Thanks so much cool. for coming in and having the conversation. Thanks for having, Thanks for having me on, guys. Cheers. Well, we promised you Zara King, and she joins us live now from the West Clare capital of Dunebeg, the home of Munster football, given the success of the Clare football. I'm not sure if Donald Trump is aware of that, though, but uh, he's on his way, Zara, anyway. He's on his way. This is also Richard Chambers' country, for those who don't know that Richard originally hails from County Clare, and not quite Dunebeg, but uh, not too far from the parish. Out yeah, the way. he's on his way. I suppose, look, by the time people... Yeah, by the time people uh, listen to this and watch it, he will have arrived. But uh, at the time of recording this afternoon, he is due to land a channel at around quarter to six. And he's going to make his way out uh, here to Trump Doombeg, which is where we're talking to you from. We're actually here in one of the uh, coastal cottages, chatting to you, myself and Conan, my cameraman. And uh, he's going to inspect his 400 acre property. So this has very much been described uh, as a business trip, one where he is uh, coming to inspect, I suppose, his financial interests here in Ireland. It's also going to be a very short visit in a sense that he only arrives as I say at tea time this evening and uh, some of the locals he's spoken to today say he'll be jetting off uh, perhaps early afternoon uh, tomorrow so it's a very short visit not even clear actually if he's going to get a chance of a round of golf in which obviously uh, we know he's a big fan of that but the weather is kind of changing here at the moment it's very very windy so even at uh, those working on the golf course not totally clear yet whether or not he'll have a chance to play before he leaves. At the junction that you're talking to us Zara so it's about three or three and a half hours before he's even due to touch down in Shannon is there much of a buzz in the village or is it a bit muted because of the weather or because you might have been there a couple of years ago or what's the general feeling around there right now? Yeah, buzz is probably not the word I'd use to describe <laughs> the atmosphere in Doombeg right now. Um, look, I was here in Doombeg when Donald Trump arrived when he was president uh, four years ago. I think it was actually May of 2019, if I'm not mistaken. So it was around the same time-ish uh, four years ago when he was here. And I remember uh, filing a report that day before he arrived. And I remember using a line in the script uh, that you would barely know a US president was about to arrive at that time. And that was four years ago. It's even quieter again today. Um the streets of Doombeg are empty. Uh, you speak to some of the locals, Rita McInerney, people will know Rita uh, owns the local shop. She's run a coffee shop here as well. She's spoken to the media many times. Uh, she sort of suggested today that maybe the media has scared the locals off the streets and they don't want to be maybe chatting to us as such. But I uh, know, look, it's it's very quiet. It's a windy day here, in fairness. Maybe people are, are staying indoors, but uh, chatting ah, to Rita I'm McInerney. Not having that. Don't, I'm not having, sorry, I'm not having, wind, wind doesn't well. keep people in indoors in West Clare. <laughs> They are out there, uh, standing on cliffs and, and getting battered around. But it is interesting that, like, that that is what you're experiencing there, though. Yeah, no, it is. Like, it's mad quiet. Like, let's be honest, it's mad quiet. There is loads of guards around, very high security. Uh, I would say, similar to the last time, more guards than punters. Um, there's a couple of American flags. I would say, though, in the village... Even the, the number of flags is sort of less than it would have been the last time, even going over the bridge there in the village. Um, I don't know about you, Conan, but I only spotted kind of one one US flag. The rest of the, the poles were actually kind of empty. So, but look, there's, you know, there's American flags in some of the houses. Look, people in Doombeg, I would say they steer away from the conversation about politics. And every time you talk to them, they will say to you, look, we don't want to get into the politics of it. They will describe Donald Trump without using his name. They'll call him the West Clare Hotelier. Um, they are incredibly grateful nice. for the business that the Trump organization brings here. Um, and, and they're very reluctant to be drawn on any conversation beyond that. Um, you know, you'll say to them, look, did your opinion change of Donald Trump, particularly after, say, for example, the January 6th situation? And they'll sort of, again deflect they'll say no look you know we're really grateful for the the business the organization brings here they'll also talk about the fact that really their relationship here in Doombeg is much more uh, with Eric and Don than uh, the father so I suppose that's something they point to as well but look in fairness to locals here in Doombeg I would say they've had quite a difficult time in terms of backlash from people for having that stance and um, Tommy Tuberty was very open today when we spoke to him on camera he said look the last time Donald Trump was here they received really nasty phone calls and letters from people all over the country criticizing them for not criticizing Donald Trump. So, look, they recognise people's frustrations, but they would also argue that uh, with a town or an area, a village of 800 to 1,000 people, a population, and 300 of those are employed at this resort, they'll say, you'll understand uh, why they will give a warm welcome to somebody who's offering that many jobs and that kind of business. Yeah, I think um, I think that's understandable. Um, I mean, the, the building and the framework around the lodge in Doombeg existed before Donald Trump was there. 
Uh, obviously, he, he picked it up. He bought it. it um, I think it was in the Irish Times. They reported that it's booked losses of 16.7 million yeah. quid since he bought it in 2014. Never booked yeah. an after-tax profit. But clearly, there is still a thing of, well, look, it's jobs in an area that depends on tourism. Um, has there anybody, in, in terms of tourism, has anybody travelled down from elsewhere in the country or anywhere around the world to try and get a glimpse of the man? One guy has, yeah. It was one <laughs> guy has in the village. The streets are empty. <laughs> I know that sounds like... No, genuinely, genuinely, oh, one, one chap has actually travelled down. Uh, David Grange is a truck driver from Dublin and uh, he's come down. He's got a massive Trump flag and a, and a big US flag and he is uh, really excited about the possibility of meeting who he would describe as his hero. He says he loves Donald Trump. Uh, he says he's supported him for many, many years. And, um, you know, he's giddy with excitement at the possibility of meeting him. He's He's basing himself in the village and he is definitely uh, potentially a one-man band in terms of that welcome. But look, it's still early in the day. You never know. There could be more people who are, are en route at the moment. But um, again, David is not deterred by any of the uh, allegations and accusations against Donald Trump. He um, is a big fan of his and he thinks that uh, he admires the way he goes about his business. Of course, uh, Richard has met many people like David uh, during his time in the States and the work that he's done on his own Trump documentary. Richard, you might maybe give us an insight into the mindset of some of these supporters they love him a lot of them think he's literally yeah. heaven sent that he is some sort of divine yeah. uh, creation who has been sent to deliver well America really not not, not anywhere else you mm. know from the clutches of evildoers and, and, and liberalism and whatnot so yeah there is that sort of devotion to a figure which you don't get with any other politician. And it's actually interesting because I think there's actually a poll from Fox News, which I have here in front of me. And despite the fact that there was such a, there was such a, a mood, even when we were covering the, the midterm elections, that the Trump phenomenon was over, that he was a busted flush, that the Democrats had done much better than expected, he has bounced back uh, to what looks fairly unassailable unless something mad happens at lead in terms of the Republican field for the nomination. Uh, he's used to, uh, in February, he was at 43%. Now he's at 53%. His main challenger, Ron DeSantis, going from 28% down to 21%. And there's a whole host of absolute also runs and losers mm. who will come, <laughs> won't come within an ass's roar of Donald Trump. There so. is one little caveat to that, though, that Ron DeSantis hasn't actually announced that he's a candidate yet. So there's always going to be this kind of slight oh, fallacy no. of, of Trump actively pursuing a campaign while DeSantis is kind of softly campaigning and putting out a book but hasn't actually kind of announced that he's going yet. Um, on the topic of um, the actual visit itself and whether David Granger is going to get a chance to meet um, mm. Trump, last time that you were there, Zara, I specifically remember you being on a, a scouting mission to see would um, the president, then president, leave the, the, the confines of the hotel and go down anywhere else. I seem to remember you ending up in, in a pub watching Don and Eric race some pint glasses and, and buy around for everyone that was there. That was yeah. as close as anyone got. Is there any yeah. any sign of even anyone in his kind of entourage doing anything like that? Or is this a very much a low profile? He's just there to check in the premises and then he's gone again. Yeah, I would say, no, there's no indication that Donald Trump's going to go down to the village, if that's what you're asking me. No, that's not. And he's never, he never has done, apparently. He's never been to the village for a walkabout as such. Uh, like I say, um, Eric and Don, Eric is with him this time, um, are regulars in the village. You know, Tommy Tuberley says that Eric would often pop in uh, for a pint. I think the last time Eric was here was last August. Sorry, they don't drink. They don't pop in for a pint, but they pop in for a chat and a, and a mineral or whatever. <laughs> um, they were here last August. Um, they have invited a group of locals to meet Donald Trump here at the resort this this evening that meeting is happening at seven o'clock uh, these are members of the local coastal erosion Acti activation group there i uh, want donald trump to support them in protecting the coast here from erosion so uh, they're coming with the mission i suppose and a local mission to have a conversation with him about that there's about 10 members of that group so as i say uh, we spoke to some of those members tommy and rita and um, liam ryan is the pro for that group as well so they're definitely coming to, to the meeting here this evening with a very focused um you know, campaign at their own end. Now, I did say to Liam Ryan, I say the PRO, I said, Liam, you know, you're in a very unique position in that not a lot of people do get face to face time with the former president, with Donald Trump. You do have an opportunity to maybe put a couple of things to him or maybe, you know, ask him some questions that people would love to ask him. Would you take that opportunity in that moment? And he said, really, uh, no, they have uh, they have a straight agenda when it comes to coastal erosion and they'll be using any minute or any time they have with him to talk about that. So, look, it goes back to what I said to you earlier on. Like, I don't, 
feel like the people of Dunbeg want to take on a kind of an international battle with Donald Trump. They are very much staying focused to the fact that this is a local business venture and they support him for that. I would say privately without uh, outwardly discussing it, they would uh, certainly have their own reservations and concerns, but they're certainly not going to say those to the media and they're not going to say them on camera. Just in relation to whether or not he's actually going to give any interviews, it's my understanding that he's not going to give any interviews here in Dunbeg this evening. Obviously, we'd love to get a, a moment to <laughs> chat to him. Um, whether or not we'll even get a chance to get close to him to get a shot, that is still not clear. There's no set itinerary as such. This is obviously a private visit in many ways, so we don't actually know. But Gavin, I know you were saying he has given an interview in Scotland to Nigel Farage, and that's due to air later this evening. Yes, I think by, by the time this, this uh, the podcast is released, by the time we go to air on, on Virgin Media 2 this evening, that will already have aired. So that was an, an interview which I think GB News is portraying as having is being live or maybe is being recorded and broadcast as live. Obviously, he will not have been in Turnbury by the time um, that the, the interview is going out, but he's, he's speaking to, to Nigel Farage, which maybe suggests that he's trying to choose his outlets pretty carefully because let's not forget Donald Trump is in the middle of a whole series of different legal skirmishes back in the United States, including mm. a civil prosecution or civil mm. uh, pursuit for an alleged rape, which is going through right now. So he obviously has to be quite sensitive about any sort of public gestures he's making, but, which I guess means we're not going to have anything close to a repeat of uh, outside St. Murdoch's Cathedral. I know you were there, Zara, a couple of weeks ago where we had Joe Biden finishing off mm. with the mayo for Sam and we're not going to have Donald Trump in the home of Clare Football announcing okay. banner, banner for Sam or, or yeah. banner for Munster Senior Football Championship at the very least anyway, much to, to Richard's permanent chagrin. Well, yeah, it's disappointing. We won't get that at least. But I mean, you, you mentioned there, Gavin, it is worth us bringing it uh, to the attention, the fact that this isn't the biggest thing happening in Donald Trump's world at the moment. Uh, he is uh, being, or his case is being heard in a Manhattan federal court for rape. A writer, uh, E. Jean Carroll, alleges Donald Trump assaulted her in a Manhattan department store in the mid-1990s. Now, he's consistently denied this, calling it fiction. Um, there has been a rejection of his request to have it heard as a mistrial. Uh, but two other women also testified that Miss Carroll told them about the incident in 1996, while another woman uh, by the name of Jessica Leeds said she was assaulted on a plane by Donald Trump in the 1970s. So this is just one of a number of legal question marks, which is going to follow and dog Donald Trump all the way through. The only thing you could say about it, though, is that, um, as you will, Zara will hear from, from David Grange, the truck driver who's come all the way down from Dublin to have a look at the man, uh, that will not change mm. any of his supporters' view on him. It is yeah. not something that will shift um, any needle in terms of the people who are devoted to and want to see Donald Trump become the president again. They're not going to be deterred by any of this. And that is something which, again, is just unlike any other political figure that we have anywhere else in the Western world, at least, I would say. I don't think we have the same level of devotion or religious fervor that follows any other person like this. So, um, Zara, I mean, you say that there's no real buzz or atmosphere there around the Trump yeah. return. Is there any chance of that changing? I mean, is there anything he could do to move that needle? Could he, inve in, you know, is there any chance of investing more money into Doombeg? Is there any chance of him saying, well, look, I'm going to help mm -hmm. you with that seawall against that coastal erosion. He's going to build that wall after all. Well... Yeah, yeah, he, he may build that wall in Doombay. I mean, there's already kind of talks afoot about building a conference centre and building a leisure centre, I think, as well, and a ballroom and all this kind of stuff as well. And I think a lot of the locals are certainly keen that he would do something like that so that the trade here wouldn't be so seasonal that it would be kind of more all year round so um, there's conversation certainly happening about that. Just to pick up on the point I suppose you're making there just in relation to all of the controversies that Donald Trump has left behind in the United States, I suppose it's worth maybe just questioning the timing of these visits to Scotland and Ireland. Now I'm not actually totally sure were they in the diary for a long time or were they just brought up in recent weeks but I mean when you think back to Donald Trump's comments when Joe Biden was here, you know he criticised Joe Biden for being in Ireland yeah. just three weeks ago when he spoke to Tucker Carlson on Fox News he said you know he's in, he's in Ireland I'm not going to Ireland I own a property in Ireland and here we are 21 days later and here he is in Ireland. So I don't know, did he potentially want um, a, a rub of the Irish, you know, a bit of, I don't know, did he want some sort of kickback? Maybe he saw how warmly received Joe Biden was, or perhaps this had been in the diary for some time. But um, when you highlight all of the uh, controversies and all of the uh, things waiting at home for Donald Trump, you would have to question whether, uh, was there some level of distraction 
involved in the trips that he has taken to Scotland and Ireland this week. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a question worth asking, I suppose. Uh, the only way he'd probably get a rub of the green is if he actually came out and showed his face in, in, in Doombag, which seems to be a little bit uncertain. But Zara, we'll let you go anyway to focus on. I uh, hope to see you back here next week. Yeah. But enjoy all of the wonders that West Clare has to offer. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. See you later. So, welcome back to the group chat. Uh, a lot of other things happening around the world at this moment in time, but one thing which caught my eye, Gav, mm. over the course of the weekend and flicking through headlines, not just here, but abroad as well, was uh, the name Trevelyan, mm. uh, which is a name that does obviously uh, raise hackles here. If anybody has ever sung along to the fields of Athen Rye, yeah. you'll be very familiar with Stole Trevelyan's Corn. Mm-hmm. The young might see the morn. Uh, the name now belongs to a former BBC journalist called Laura Trevelyan, uh, who is the great, great, great granddaughter, fa- or daughter, yes, of mm-hmm. Charles Trevelyan, Sir Charles Trevelyan to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. senior... Sorry, I wasn't going to give him his knighthood, but fine. Okay, be like Sen- that. Senior British government official who, back during the famine, yes. uh, was um, effectively had the duty of running the British Treasury in terms of famine relief yeah. and became a hate figure, very understandably, mm-hmm. given the British government's role in not addressing the concerns of Indeed. people in Ireland who were literally... There, there was adequate street. food, just wasn't given inadequate measure. So, Laura Trevelyan has, over recent years, um, become a campaigner. She has re- resigned from the BBC uh, and moved on to become a campaigner. And what she does is she is a full-time campaigner for restorative justice for the slave trade because Mr. Trevelyan also did horrendous things off his own back and not on behalf of the British government okay, right. uh, in the Caribbean in terms of um, her fa- the, the family of Trevelyan owned hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of enslaved people uh, in uh, Grenada, for example. Mm. So the whole point is she's been putting forward some of the family's money towards paying off some of that debt. And it's always become a thing that since this ever started, people were like, well, what about Ireland? Mm. And now she's finally addressed that and she says her family would consider paying compensation to Ireland uh, but maybe it's more of a question for the British government. But that was going to be my first gut response Mm. because there's a difference between what somebody does in a personal capacity which as you've outlined Charles Trevelyan having personal you know interest in slave ownership and then what you do in your kind of official capacity as a result of your job. I mean the first question and maybe it applies to both is where would you start? Like it's so difficult at generations of remove, 150 years plus, mm. even when you're talking about the personal, the, the family's ownership of slaves, how feasible even, even is it on that front to go down through the generations and find the people who are the just recipients of any reparations that you might give? Like well, that, that can't be easy in its own right. Yeah, it certainly can't. So that's why I think a lot of the ideas of restorative justice and reparations as it becomes known in the United States when it's talked about it focuses more on what you could do in terms of, so say, for example, we mentioned Granada, you'd pay it towards the Granada government and see what okay. they do there. If you're looking, So you give it to a whole community and not just to the direct people. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's a very hard thing to work out. But yeah. this is all, it's actually a very new concept and it is interesting that more and more people are talking about it, including, uh, we'll come around to him, uh, one King Charles of the United Kingdom. <laughs> um, but it is interesting because Ireland has never been the same since the famine. Obviously, you had the death of one million people, the emigration of mm. perhaps two million more. Uh, the population of Ireland never recovered. No, still, still not at the level that it was in the 1840s. No, so there mm. has been obviously an ongoing economic impact of it. Also, if you're looking at the point of, well, who exactly would pay this? Would the British government pay this? Well, famously enough, Tony Blair, when he was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, gave a statement which was effectively considered an apology for the famine. So is that not an admission of responsibility Mm. in terms of the British government's handling of it? He said that those who governed in London at the time failed their people through standing by while a crop failure turned into a massive human tragedy. So that was hailed as an apology at the time. Is there I don't, well, I couldn't see a Tory government. I, I I couldn't see any government doing it for the plain reason that although this is obviously a very contested idea on this island or at least in this part of the island, you have to remember that any government that was in situ in Britain in the 1840s and 50s considered this island to be just as much a part of its country as anywhere else. And they would find it very difficult then to think, well, why would you consider reparations or anything restorative for Ireland when one could make the same parallel argument for well, the people of Wales were let down in the pursuit of policy X or the people of Scotland were let down in the pursuit of policy Y or the people of Cornwall or Devon or or Manchester or Newcastle or any individual place. If they considered to be Ireland as an inseparable, insoluble part of the UK, which they did, 
it's very difficult then to say in hindsight, well, because mo most of the island is now independent, that we should consider doing something back or offsetting the mistakes of the past. That's the, the first point. And then B, at what point do you, do you say, tough as it is to sort of get your head around 180 years following on, to go, well, that's just the consequence of political mismanagement and that policies fail all the time. We were talking to Michael in part one mm. about the consequence of, of policies failing. And is it fair to always expect there to be some kind of, you know, gesture in response in hindsight to try and address the wrong that was done? Or is it just the consequence of politicians not being able to act in the best interest of the people they represent? Yeah, I suppose there is that historical debate as to whether or not it was actually you know, an act yeah. of genocide, really, mm. rather than just a complete ineptitude yeah. and the lack of... Because caring. the food was there and it was misallocation yeah. of that food, despite the blight that there was. I'm I always found it quite ironic that in more latter days, there was another Trevelyan, Amory marie Trevelyan, who was, I think she was one of the spate of ministers who resigned when we did our Meltdown special live when Boris Johnson's cabinet yes, was, she was resigning as we recorded, that she was the secretary responsible for international trade mm. and, and aid. And the, the, the irony, not appreciated by many in Whitehall and very much understood by many people in Ireland that it was a Trevelyan responsible for Britain's outreach to other parts of the world. And it must be mentioned as well, Anne-Marie Trevelyan's husband was a relative of the late, 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 late okay. Sir Charles Trevelyan. So it's still a link there. Okay. Um, I did mention King Charles there. Obviously, it is his coronation mm. uh, at the weekend. This is a guy who has previously said that there should be reparations or there should be, it should be examined at least. Like, Lord Trevelyan has actually called on King Charles to apologise for Britain's role in the slave trade. Mm. There doesn't seem to be much debate in terms of anything to do with the role of the royal family or the trappings of empire, which will be on show once again mm. over the next number of which, days. Like, which will still be there because I know that there's an attempt this time around to not have this exposition of as many of the literal trappings of conquest mm. as you might have seen in other times. But they're, they're still there. They're still visible. You like, hide you, them like, you Yeah, know. but you, like, you've, you've spoken on, on, on the podcast before about a particular jewel, which is, I think is not going to be on show the this Saturday. The Koh-i-Noor, yes. I'm, I, as far as I'm aware now from reading articles before, the Koh-i-Noor, which is one of the largest cut diamonds in the world uh, and it is currently set in the crown of what was Queen Elizabeth and now the Queen Mother. Just a huge diamond belongs to India. Mm. Well, India's always wanted it back because it was nicked uh, unmercifully yeah. by the, the British government at the time. Uh, but apparently it won't be uh, in the coronation ceremony. That would have been part of Camilla's crown okay. in terms of this now. But there will obviously be a lot of other plundered jewels on display. <laughs> yeah. So if you're, obviously, dis if you're yeah. disappointed about not getting to see the Koh or you'll yeah. have plenty more shiny things which have been plundered uh, <laughs> over the backs and blood of many, many people over many, many generations there. But it is, I mean, they've been playing this up as being a low-key coronation. And yet, in spite of that, there has been over the last number of days, the news that if you're watching in the pub, as many people will be, or if you're watching at home, you will be invited. Mm. Swear your fealty in an oath to King Charles. Which, which I find remarkable because Charles, look, I mean, the guy is still on the throne of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and is the head of state of 15 or 16 other countries around the world. So like he's obviously, he, if he's not repudiating any of that, he is comfortable to a point with mm -hmm. the idea of monarchy and divine right of kings and all the likes. But Charles, at least to his mitigating credit, has been quite open in the course of his life about wanting to try and, you know, redress some of that balance and make sure that those who are worst off in society yeah. get their, their fair amount of a leg up. Which then, I find it very contradictory that having spent a lot of his life on a lot of that social outreach sort of stuff and conservation and everything else that he does, that if this hasn't been a part of previous coronations where people who've been watching it at home, uh, you know, in, in their living rooms or in street parties or in the pub or wherever they might be, it's never been a part before of coronations. Granted, there hasn't been many in the broadcast era, but there've been, mm. there were three, there were like the accessions of three kings in 1936 or whatever, and then Elizabeth's succession in, in a coronation in 53. It's never been a part before that people around the country were expected to just stand up in the middle of nothing. Like, like the scene in The Angelus, where you stand up in the middle yeah. of whatever else that you're doing stare and stand up and say, stare off wistfully and say, I declare my fealty to Charles III of the Great Britain and Northern Ireland and, and all of his successors and heirs. Like, so if this is part of the arrangements, Charles must be comfortable with that being a part of the thing. Mm. And I just find that really jarring that a guy who who sort of wears his, his, his privilege on his sleeve to a point is OK with the idea that people will be invited to stand up in the middle of wherever they are in a shopping centre, in the queue for a KFC. Yeah. 
and standing up and saying, sorry, I'll get my, my Zauer my Zauer Tower Burger, Zinger Tower Burger in a minute. But first of all, I need to go and declare my my fealty to the king. Monarchs, Gav. Bizarre. They're just like us. <laughs> they're, they're just like us. Ooh. Expect Except they expect you to declare your fealty at a moment's notice. Why don't they just do it on social media? It's like one retweet equals one respect for <laughs> King Charles, uh, uh, the new... The new. But actually, yeah, he'd my, love that. My question, I mean, it is a very naive question, is, is why do they need to do a coronation at all? Like, he's already the king, isn't he? Yeah. He's already um, on stamps and coins and whatnot. He's yeah. They, it's, as, it, as, it, soon, it, as soon as his mother died, he was the king. Yeah. We are now how many months on? It is that was last many. It was last September October. Yeah, yeah. You were there, so was there, yeah. yeah. So you you should. I I wasn't there. You were there, so you should remember. But it was last autumn, so it's it's like nine months. Um, Elizabeth, it was f- fifteen or sixteen months between Eighth September. I hear in my ear. It was the day of the Queen's death. Yep. So that's now, that's nine months on. Yeah. Uh, so the Queen, Queen Elizabeth uh, became the Queen in February of 52 and wasn't coronated until June of 53. The idea being you're supposed to wait a few months to sort of observe this kind of unofficial period of national mourning before you get on. Um, it's it's a legit question because um, the in the year that we had the three kings, when, when Edward abdicated hmm. before he went off to marry Wallace Simpson, he, he never had a coronation because his father was died. But like, it's not like anyone questioned his, his legitimacy. So like... Other than maybe the act of sort of signing a warrant or something, which he did in the days after Elizabeth said, he kind of question what's the point of having a big do to celebrate the fact you're already in the gig anyway. And it's not even just the big do on the day itself. There has been a week, a week and more mm. of build up on the news channels in the UK yeah. to this thing, which hasn't happened yet. And nothing's going to change. We all know what's going to happen yeah, yeah. at the end of it. I've just remembered that, of course, there's a religious aspect to this as well, because he's kind of being installed as yes. the Supreme Governor of the Church of England and not just as the head of state, which is also a bizarre Thing when you think about it that he's the head of the state church and he's also the head of the state uh, in a nice touch they will be speaking Irish at it though yes which is nice, to, nice for, to for it to have at least some acknowledgement considered to be a native language of one of the four constituent parts of the UK yeah. which is nice for it to be acknowledged because there's obviously plenty of people in that corner of the island who would rather not be acknowledged but it's no harm to anyone yeah. to be there President Higgins and uh, the Tisha Cleo Radker will be over there for it if you are doing anything for the coronation if you are so inclined please do let us know we'd love to see So we talked a lot of about, well, succession in particular, but television <laughs> yeah. over the last while, mm. film as well. Big, big news in the world of television. Writers teams as part of the Writers Guild of America. These are the writing teams who write your favourite TV shows, whether they be scripted or they be your nightly shows, your Jimmy Fallon's, your Trevor Noah's, mm. your, you know, Jimmy Kimmel's, even the Saturday Night Live. They're all going on strike. Mm. And this is big news because it's automatically taken a load of those not- late night talk shows already off the air. Mm. Uh, Saturday Night Live will not be on this weekend um, as a result of this yeah big 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 news Mm. but also this could have a knock on effect for the big shows that people do watch here I remember the last time because there was one 2007 is it that is it that long ago 16 years ago I remember like there were some um, series of some of the bigger shows that were still running at the time like I think there was one of um, a a series of Sex and the City which only became 7 or 8 episodes because they ordinarily would go a dozen or more but they were like, well, we just don't have anyone to write the plot. So this is now going to be a short series. So you see these things, like a strike that happens now, even if it's resolved in the space of a couple of weeks, which it may be or it may not be, does end up having consequences for like months and like maybe even years of production time to come. It is also a useful reminder that people who are paid many millions to be funny on television are not natively funny and that they need a whole team of funny people to put funny things into their mouths. I don't want to name names, but we've talked with James Corden before on this show. <laughs> and that is a name. Um, and of course, it was reported, and of course, he'd probably deny this, but it was reported in the US media that he had uh, said that, he, that his writers didn't deserve to be paid more. It's very funny that his last show was literally just a week gone before the writer strike mm. began. So that, um, so that he did have something of a proper farewell and not some sort of muted thing where the people I don't know if it's coincidental, but it is kind of it is kind of funny. But the mm. point, which is worth making, is that we're in a golden age of television. That's what we all understand it to be. We're yeah. seeing films being outstripped in terms of dramatic quality by television. The golden era could be coming to an end as a result of this, mm. because you mentioned what happened in the last TV writer strike. I remember anybody who's uh, watched Friday Night Lights. Uh, They basically did a whole season where they just ploughed on without the writers and it became a full soap opera. Uh, The worst Bond movie of recent years, Quantum of Solace, was literally... Was that produced during that time? Yes, it was. And it's why everybody hates it. Because the only people who are allowed to change the script on the day, which is often what happens in films, were Daniel Craig, who admits, I'm not a writer, it was horrible, Mm. and the director. So it was a complete S show 
right. the way through. Breaking Bad also lost a couple of episodes from its first season as a result of it. Okay. Um, so there's going to be a huge change to shows that people know and love. One thing that, which is remarkable is that part of the motivation for the Writers Guild going on strike is their concern that a lot of the jobs could be outsourced to the emergence of AI tools, the likes of ChatGPT, mm. and that you could ask uh, the likes of a ChatGPT, were it better equipped on the issues of the day to write a topical gag about stuff that's been in the news and not need a whole team of writers throwing punchlines at each other all day to figure out what sticks and what doesn't. And I'm kind of struck by the irony that if they want to, not, not saying there's anything illegitimate with going on strike and trying to preserve their, their terms and conditions and whatnot, but that having walked off the field and decided not to work for an indefinite period, they might in fact be inviting people to rely on AI tools to write scripts simply mm. to plug the holes, thereby proving that actually they may be surpassable by technology anyway. If you're, if you're, if you're, if the message you're giving me there, Gab, is that the billionaire owners of media production companies in the States, whether they be, you know, Apple's Tim Cook or whatever like that, might see the opportunity to squeeze things even more, mm. given that the writers are on such low money. And that yeah. is a worrying, that is a worrying potential mm. offspin of this. Because so. that, that is a thing which is not appreciated by many, the fact that they actually genuinely do not earn a huge amount, uh, particularly when the writer pools for the likes of SNL are so big. You're talking about a team of writers, which is like 18 or 20 yeah. people. There's a room off the room where the junior writers you know, workshop jags, which, gags, which then get passed on to the senior writers. And there's so many of them and there's only a finite pool of money to go around. They're all living off very little and they make a lot of entertainment for very little reward for themselves. Mm. So they are perfectly entitled to go looking for better terms and conditions. But like you say, these things, they're always looking to try and squeeze a margin wherever they can. And if they can outsource a lot of it to a tech tool that you don't pay, it's an entirely well, plausible thing to happen. No writer's room in the world of news, so we will still be here. Uh, despite it all next week Gavin thank you very much Thanks, Richard. for joining us Zara thank you very much of course uh, she was here earlier on so I'm thanking her in her absence but thank you the listener for joining us here in the group chat we'll be back next week bye for now bye